When the clock strikes midnight on January 1st, people around the globe celebrate with the hope that the next year will be better than the last. This feeling was perhaps more palpable as the world ushered in 2021. Waving goodbye to a difficult 2020, then come the resolutions as people endeavor to do better. The most popular resolutions people are making include changing diet, saving money, exercising more, traveling more, chasing their passion, and learning something new. However, research shows that the failure rate for New Year resolutions is at about 80%, and most people lose their resolve by mid-February. The most common excuses for failing to see resolutions through are a lack of willpower, forgetting, being lazy, and now COVID-19. So the big question is, are we unreasonable with our resolutions? I think resolutions are trying are an effort to create reasonableness in an unreasonable time. So they are a form of a personal compass. And I think the principle behind them is simply that if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. I don't think people are being unreasonable. I think it's good and healthy to have the goals. And I think people might not have been equipped to know how to achieve those goals in a structured and sustainable way, which we can discuss today. Well, those are my guests tonight. We have Kosi Giane, a clinical psychologist from South Africa, and Moses Richu, a personal finance expert and entrepreneur from Kenya. With a panel like that, it's bound to be exciting. Let's get connected. Well, hello and welcome to Kenya Connects from the BBC and KTN News. My name is Sharon Mashira and I'll be your host tonight. Now, making New Year resolutions is an age-old tradition, but after the tumultuous year that we just had, many people have shied away from setting these personal goals. So are people making New Year resolutions? Well, here's a sample of voices from different parts of the continent answering that question. Yo, it's Phil, a.k.a. Re Dimakula, yo. And I haven't made a New Year resolution because, I mean, life is uncertain and things change all the time. So I just take it one day at a time. Re, love and life, man. Peace out. These resolutions that we set limit us in one way or the other. We fail to appreciate the small wins that we achieve during the course of the year because our big aim is the resolutions. We fail to appreciate what we achieve that we had not set in our resolutions and i believe this is limiting the reason why some of you are not realizing your resolutions is because you're not realistic jesus christ you just can't make resolutions that are hard to achieve and you keep piling them up because some of you you now have resolution areas the only resolution you need to make is to visit some of your resolutions from 10 years ago and this comes from always lying to ourselves so me i'm realistic I'm going to tell you some of the lies that we always say to ourselves that block us from having realistic resolutions. And I'm going to use these papers. New year, new me. Really. Look at yourself. Aren't you still short? Mm -hmm. Then this whole, oh, the new year is like a blank book. You get to write on all the pages what you want it to be like. <laughs> With the defaults you still have from last year. If you haven't yet paid rent for November and, 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 and December, uh, mm -hmm. you think that girl you made pregnant, oh, the pregnancy is going to magically disappear and you write a new book. The first 20 pages of the book are taken by the last year. And then this last one, I will marry this year. You, you think you just go to a supermarket and you find a woman in the stalls? <laughs> Kosi, what is your reaction watching that? <laughs> well, I think there's truth in all of them, but I think the third guy was quite hilarious uh, because there's truth to what he's saying. I mean, he's saying we become unrealistic uh, and we lie to ourselves because resolutions are about living in the future, right? And, and the first guy was saying one day at a time because we can only be in this one day, not even just the one day, this one moment that we are in the eternal now. So there's truth to all of that. And I think that's the beauty, that's the trick, uh, that's the challenge. That's, those are all dynamics we have to take into account because yeah. within all of that, there is a sense that says you still have a responsibility for your own individualized life. What are you going to do with you? 
That's right. what resolutions speak to. And what about you, Moses? What is going through your mind watching that? The purpose of a resolution is to say who do I want to become, not necessarily what thing do I want to achieve, right? And if you start looking at it like that, then who do I want to become starts being about a journey. So instead of saying, for example, oh, I want to get married, you could say, I want to have clarity on the type of person I want to be in a romantic relationship. Um, and as soon as you start saying, what sort of person am I becoming? How am I evolving my identity? Then your New Year's resolutions start to make a lot more sense. And, and there's also this tendency to revolt against New Year's res resolutions because they might be perceived to clash with enjoying the present moment, you know, saying, if I resolve to be better in X next year, then I can't live today. And that's not only is that false, but it's also a trap you're setting for yourself that you don't realize you've set for yourself. Because by refusing to commit to a better version of your future self, you are choosing to commit to whatever limitations you had today. Mm -hmm. And and Kosi, you know, research has shown that 80% um, of New Year resolutions fail. Is there something psychologically wrong with us? Why is that the case? Something that defines us as human beings, it is a sense of uh, teleological. We are purposeful in our lives. There's a sense of striving to thrive. We are not designed to just survive and just get by. So right. there is that innate capacity within us that spurs us on to a better version of ourselves. And right. that is what these speak to. Right. And, and Moses, let's, let's talk about money. <laughs> you know, in January, we say there's more month than, than money. And it's almost set in stone. Every single year, we're here with the same exact problem. Where, where do we go wrong? Where we go wrong in terms of money, I, I think there's a, there's a couple of places. And I think it actually ties pretty closely to where we go wrong generally in terms of our goals, right? So um, there, there are, I think, three, like three things that come to mind. The first is, I think we set, we set very high goals, um, maybe because we think that our problem was not, were, were not sufficiently motivated. So for example, last year we said, um, oh, I entered January and I was broke by the 5th. This year I'll have a million by the 5th. <laughs> right. Um, a million is very far from being broke. Right. You could just say, hey, I'll have a surplus in my account by the fifth. Right. Because motivation was not the issue. The issue was the pro the system you had. So in December, you still spent like crazy. So that system is bound to put you in a deficit, regardless of how motivated you are for your billion in January. Right? That's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is we don't we don't revise our plan in order to help us stay on track with our goal. You could say, oh, I'm gonna save I don't know, 100,000, right? Um, and then you have uh, you have a salary cut because pandemic, or you have maybe you're, uh, you're a person who gets contracts from places and those contracts reduce, but you don't say, okay, my goal is to save 100,000. Maybe I can cut my expenses in some way, shape or form to help me get closer to that goal, right? Instead of just abandoning the goal, right? So as long as, if, if we don't choose goals, so if you say, for example, I'm gonna save 100,000 and eat out more and work less, you're kind of setting yourself up for failure, right? Mm -hmm. So it's really important to say, while choosing this goal, what other things am I choosing that must go together to help me achieve that goal? I, I look at a, 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 a sixth source frame for making any resolutions or any behavioral changes in our lives. So what we tend to do is we fall into what I refer to as a source one, which is personal motivation. You don't get anywhere without it, but it cannot be. There cannot be a, a magic silver bullet approach to this. And what Moses was touching on would be source two, which is personal ability. Can I actually do this? Can I save 100,000 a month? Is that realistic? Is it doable? You're going to start use, losing your motivation because your source two, the ability is not properly set up. You move to the next layer, which is your social. Because as we know, life is not a solo performance. Life is a choir. There are always people in our circle of influence, uh, consciously and unconsciously, that are influencing us in some way. So source three talks about who are the people that are your motivators. And then the next layer is to look at what are the non-human things, the structural things that you have to put in. So for example, you can build in rewards and punishments. You can't just rely on source one, which is your personal motivation. It doesn't right. work that way. I like that you've you know, offered solutions. And, and just on that note, Moses, could you give us any tips on how we can save our what's left of dry January? There are two things. The first is what things can you do to tangibly improve your January? And what things can you do to tangibly improve the rest of the year in January?
right? Um, so to tangibly improve your January, you just say, guys, this is where I am. And I was trying to save X. This means I need to adjust, as an example, my social plans in this way. Uh, how do you improve the rest of your year based on the time that you have in January, right? There's still like any something. Uh, the biggest thing is to make a decision that is built on identity and not on motivation. Who, who am I and what behavior confirms that I am that person? And you just commit to that thing. And you can't commit to many, right? Because you can't be a billion people. But you will just choose in January or in whatever landmark moment is important to you, as, as has been flagged. You can commit whenever. The last thing that human minds can live with is meaninglessness. We are always about creating meaning, right? The question is, who am I? What am I? What is my life about? What are my aspirations? At the end of the year, being able to connect the two and say, yes, I have become the person that I set out to be who is the person who is a thousand rand richer today because every month I have made it possible by creating a soft six account through which money was taken from my account as a debit order into that account. Therefore, it's realizable. You're not wrong when you say, I feel terrible about making uh, resolutions or I feel it is pointless. Like your feelings are valid. An identity is not built in a second. You have your whole life to build your identity. Just gradually become the person you want to be. I, I think that the, the principle behind what Moses has just said, you know, there's a principle that says become a scientist and a subject. Study mm. you. Because mm. there is always evidence. So what we're saying is that success breeds success as much as failure breeds success. So use everything as information. It is data. What an amazing conversation. I'm personally feeling motivated to actually go back and revisit my New Year's resolution. So here's what else you need to know about from around the world in just 60 seconds. Now, hip hop legend and music mogul Dr. Dre was hospitalized for a brain aneurysm, sending shockwaves across social media. Millions of his fans from across the world sent an outpour of messages wishing him well. He's since been released and is set to be in recovery soon. And Nigeria expects to get its first batch of COVID-19 vaccines by the end of this month as part of its plan to inoculate 40 percent of the population this year and a further 30 percent next year. Nigeria will first vaccinate frontline health workers, first responders, national leaders and the vulnerable population such as the elderly. The country hopes to get 42 million vaccines to cover a fifth of its population through the scheme. Now talking of resolutions, here's a man whose resolve or life goal is to fight against human rights violations. Let's get connected to the personal politics of Khalid Hussein. My name is uh, Hussein Khalid. I'm a human rights activist and the executive director of Haki Africa. What got me into activism actually uh, was way back in high school when I saw that uh, there were a group of, uh, I would say, bullies who were trying um, to interfere and harass um, students who wanted to do better because it was a culture in the school I was in. So I was lucky enough, I got a lot of support from other colleagues. And from that point on, I said, I will not keep quiet when I see injustice. In my country, Kenya, and particularly here at the coast, human rights violations are very high. So to be able to do something about that, to give people a voice, to empower locals, to be able to champion for their rights is, is my conviction. And I feel that every other day, when I'm able to make even the smallest of difference, then I'm able to sleep better at night, but then it also motivates me to wake up to face the next day. I think the problem of enforced disappearances is real in Kenya. Um, just this year alone, we have able to document seven cases of disappearances where people have been returned after going out publicly and advocating for their return. And uh, it's actually one of the greatest challenges of our times. Because for someone to just, you know, disappear into thin air, you can just imagine as a family what they are thinking. For you not knowing whether you will see your husband ever again. You don't know if you're a widow or you're still married. If you're a child, you don't know whether you will see your father again. So I would say, yes, there is a difference. Yes, we are realizing uh, positive uh, responses, but it is still not enough. In 2015, when the government, uh, um, um, I would say, blacklisted Haki Africa and uh, froze our accounts, for me, it was the lowest moment of my career 
particularly in human rights activism. Because the work we are doing is to complement security authorities, is to complement the work of security officers. They then turn against us. Because at that time, we were already facing uh, challenges, uh, fears and threats from violent extremist groups, saying that we are cutting off their supply. Luckily, there were individuals, friends, and some also in government who told me, like, you know, you should not give up. Because if you give up as an institution, imagine what message you will be sending to the community. Every case that we handle, we are actually creating an enemy for ourselves. I fear for my life every day. And the people that I fear for the most is actually my family. Because sometimes I feel I put my family in unnecessary danger. I've had to go into hiding on several occasions, but that in any way does not deter me. If anything, it even motivates me to do more. I wouldn't exchange what I do uh, for anything. Kosi, what is your reaction watching that? There's a fear attached to this. It is never just an easy road to choose, not just for himself, but for his family, his loved ones, people that are not necessarily involved in the cause, but who will have to, yeah, he has to be concerned about for their safety because those people that got, get unsettled by his actions will go for, if not for him, they will also go for those that he cares about in order to demoralize, to break the spirit um, of his cause. Right. And, and he's saying, you know, he has, to, he has to soldier on in spite of that. It's not an easy road to choose. Right. That's why many people stand by and watch. And as the saying goes, all it takes for evil to thrive is for be good people to say nothing and do nothing. That's really powerful. Moses, what are your thoughts? I think it's really important that all people are activists, right? Um, because what is the purpose of your role, your, you know, your privilege, your leadership, your, the things that you have, if you don't use those to then protect and support those with less power, less authority, less privilege, right? And no one's asking you to run onto the front lines, right? No one said, go out and get shot. But people have said, either you like stand up and help directly, or you stand up and help the people who help directly. But stand up and do something. Exactly. And this is about the different levels of resolve, right? And um, we can make resolutions about the biggest things in life to champion a cause, right? Or we can make a, 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 a resolution to champion your own personal cause, right? So we don't have to be helpless victims, which is what Moses was talking about, that learned helplessness. But learned helpfulness is what it's about. Very interesting perspectives. Now, I'm going to have to move us on um, onto a musical note. Now, you know, they say every place has its soul. So let's head over to Uganda, where there's a particular zone in Uganda's capital, Kampala, with artists and musicians of all nature flocking to a particular space. What makes Makinde a musician's paradise? Well, BBC's Masharia Minor explores the story behind Kampala's musical Mecca. Take a look. Where do you go if you want good music in Uganda? For over 25 years, in the heart of the capital, Kampala, Makinde Hill has housed a large majority of Uganda's artists who rule East Africa's airwaves. This hill is the go-to place for artists both veteran and novice. Actually, the reality, this, this is like the Hollywood. Because this way, this way, by the beyond even music, even art, there's a lot of actors that live here. There are lots of... Uh, Promoters who live in here. Jose Chameleon is one of Uganda's popular artists, earning millions of dollars in music revenue. He is driving us through Makindie on our way to one of the country's renowned music producers, Padiman, one of the prominent musicians who owns a studio on this hill. You see, you see this, this, this must be an artist right here. Because I can see it's written Gagamela. You see? <laughs> Gagamela is by Bebe Cool. Back in the 90s, there was a very big studio in Makine that was called the Dungeon Studios. But that was brought by a gentleman called Peter Samatimba, who owns a radio station now. And it was like the foundation of young people's music because he signed very many artists of that generation. So everybody wanted to come to Makine to leave close. So I think that initiated studios in this place. Million's glamour story also began in a more humble Makinde. Oh, yo. Yeah, man. Like Chameleon, many artists now throng this hill 
which is one of the five administration zones in Kampala. Padiman houses one of the studios attracting many of these artists. I think there are many studios in this place because there are many artists as well in the studio. I mean in much India. So in terms of uh, business, you want to bring business closer to your clients. Personally, that's, that, 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 that was my intention. Uh, Makinye houses are a bit not so expensive. At least in every house there is an artist. How many studios do you think there are in Makinye? Professionally, 40 around there, the big, the big ones. And then the small, the small ones you cannot tell. One will move with their gadgets today. Today they are there, tomorrow they are not there. As technology continues to make music production easier, this old hill continues to carry the tunes and the musicians that make them. Yo! Well, thank you so much for following me right to Padiman Audio One Studios. And um, thank you for coming to Machi India. Great. So, Kosi, what is your reaction watching that? Well, I mean, I'm just reminded what comes up, what, what jumps to mind for me is the kind of energy, you know, there's something about, there's, <laughs> there's a, an expression that says, if you want to be a big flea, you must move around big dogs, right? <laughs> so so it, it is about creating that space, there's that vibe, there's that uh, atmosphere that actually feeds on what you strive to become as a musician, right? Mm -hmm. So it is about like unto like. If you want to be a musician, what are you doing around accountants? Wow. Moses, what about you? What's really interesting is that these conditions also eventually destroy that ecosystem. So, for example, with artists, when a place becomes too cool, it gets gentrified. And people are willing to pay more to live there, and thus the cost of living goes up, and thus artists are edged out and out. And so that then destroys that same ecosystem that it created. You know, same with tech. Like, initially it's affordable to live there, but suddenly everyone wants to live there, People are willing to pay high salaries, people pay more for homes. That again destroys the ecosystem. And you see that happening, you know, um, more firms move out of uh, the Silicon Valley in the States because it's become too expensive, right? You see it happening when Brooklyn starts producing a lot less hip hop because suddenly a lot fewer rappers live there, right? So it's, it's interesting that you have these conditions that create an outcome. The same conditions when too successful destroy that outcome. Um, and I, I just think it's a very interesting pattern. Right. Okay. And, you know, this is my favorite part of the show where I get to ask you what you've connected with the most throughout this entire program. So we can start with you, Kosi. What have you connected with the most in, in a few words? Uh, I think the first two, the story um, in terms of resolutions and the advocacy, because I think those two really are about uh, a resolution is a form of advocacy um, in your own life. And, and I think what it speaks to is the extent to which we are doomed to choice in life regardless of the circumstances that we find ourselves in how tough it is and 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 we've all as a human community been thrown by the COVID pandemic um in 2020 we still have a responsibility it does not change that ultimately there's a singularity to life that we have to make a choice in and some of those choices are very very hard you know and if you think about what he was saying in terms of the advocacy work is that it's a choice between saying there's a price to pay in life. There's a choice as consequence. And it will kill me to do this, but it will kill me even more not to do it. So I'd rather die working towards the cause that really um, lights me up, that gives my life purpose and meaning. Because the last thing that human mind can tolerate is meaninglessness of life. Wow, powerful. What about you, Moses? What did you connect with the most? Um, you know, we tend to really glamorize people who stand up to do a thing. Uh, we really admire the work that Hacky is doing, as uh, that the Hacky organization is doing, as an example, because they've stood up and said, we are choosing to improve the lives of X, Y, Z, right? However, by doing that, we tend to forget that we can be our own heroes. We can choose to take a step in that path. Like we said, no one's saying run into the front lines, but by standing up and saying, I will contribute to causes that do, I will wake up and do three push-ups. I will, all these things turn us into versions of things we're trying to become, and thus can choose to be our own heroes. I love that. And I think we've had such an interesting conversation. I'm already feeling very inspired, but we've come to the end of the program. You know, that's all we had for you today on Kenya Connects from the BBC and KTN News. I've been your host, Sharon Mashira. And until next time, it's goodbye for now.